Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the first annual Weekend of Women Plus. First of all, I would, start, would like to start with a, a land acknowledgement. I would like to thank and acknowledge all the people that become, came before us in the traditional lines, lands. Um, the Tutelo, the Shapani, the Catawba, and the Kiyawi. Um, we respect both the elders and the presence. So thank them. This event could not have been pulled off if it wasn't for some amazing people. So I would like to do a special call out to uh, Molly McCarter, Chris Julio, Clifton Taylor, and Susan Crabtree. What an amazing bunch of freshman faculty that have been volunteering their time the entire year to make this work. And they should be thanked for their, their hard work and their dedication. In addition to that, I also want to thank all the student volunteers that have helped with this. They are amazing and this is their event. So please stand up all the students that have worked on this. In addition to that, In addition to that, I want to also thank the design and production faculty who has been relentless on getting people to and from the airport and shepherding everybody and helping out with this event. It takes a village and that's what we have. Also, I'd like to thank interim um, Provost Karen Peterson, Karen Peterson, who has helped us with financial support and the Keenan Foundation. This is an amazing event that we're having. This is really groundbreaking. This really looks at what our issues are and tackles them. And I am so excited that we can do this and we can do this for not just us, but for you and everybody at this university. One of the things I wanna talk real quickly about is the tracks. We have three tracks that we're on. We made a commitment to your parents that we would educate you. They are working double jobs, sacrificing money and vacation to bring you here. We're doing this, one, for them. Two, we're doing it for the students because you all have dreams, and our job is to get you to your dreams. That is the number one focus that we have. But the third track, which is the most deadly track, is how to launch you properly, not into a job that's easy, but how to launch you into a sustainable career that will take you to the heights that you're gonna end up in and make you leaders. That's what this is all about. So, as we go forward, there's three goals, four goals I wanna talk about. One, be tough. These are tough issues that we're dealing with. Two, highest standards lead by the highest standards, by example. Be optimistic. And the number one goal, what I want to say is, status quo is not a strategy. Status quo is not how we move into the future. So with that being said, I would like to introduce our moderator. Iris Cole, she uh, runs a social group, a social enterprise group and foundation of, she raises the bar. It's a corporate and social responsibility and sustainable action consulting group. In addition to that, she has most recent venture is Do Good Artists. It's a pioneering social challenge of multiple, uh, multiple people in industry and private sector. So Iris is gonna moderate this, this event and ask some very hard questions. So with that being said, I'm handing it off to Iris. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much um, for having me. Uh, it's a real honor to be sitting with um, these women up here um, to talk about some really difficult subjects. But um, I think today, you know, what it is about is it's about bringing light 
um, to challenges. It's about having a really um, amazing dialogue about how we navigate those challenges um, and, and how within spaces in which we operate, what everybody can do um, to, to help you know, advance um, women, and there is definitely um, a gender gap in many, many, many industries. You know, I've, um, I've been involved for a long time um, working with women in all sorts of countries, um, looking at the gender gap um, here locally and what that means to the community, and, um, and it really means a lot to me. So again, I'm so happy and honored to be up here with you um, to, to just dig in. Um, so we have a lot of questions today. Uh, the questions were submitted by students, and we're going to kind of stick uh, with those questions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to ask those questions, and I've I've asked everyone here to just kind of jump into the conversation, and um, you know if they feel really strongly about it, and then and we'll keep moving. So we're just going to get started. Um, but first of all, I'd like to go down the line and have everybody introduce themselves, um, your name, your you know, kind of area of expertise and why you're here. And uh, we talked about it backstage, but tell us a, a superpower that you have. <laughs> uh -oh. So maybe we'll start there. Hi, I'm Harita Jones and I'm representing the hair and makeup department. Um, superhero, patience. <laughs> and being persistent, that would probably be the best two attributes because sometimes when things are really tough and you're really tired from 18-hour days, that's the only thing that's going to get you through it is the big picture. And then you'll survive it and you'll be awake <laughs> <laughs> even when you are uh, been up 22 hours uh, trying to get a scene done. That's probably the best thing I can say. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julia Berkeley. I'm here representing Scenic Art. I work as a project manager and a charge artist in New York City. Um, superpowers, I can walk very, very fast, which is useful as a short person. Um, <laughs> and looking at challenges as problems to solve and puzzles that need to be fixed. Uh, I'm Cricket Myers. I'm a sound designer based in Los Angeles. Uh, and I would say my superpower is like communicating and translating, because uh, everybody kind of, every director speaks their own language and has their own terms that they like, and I'm uh, really good at adapting to uh, someone else's language and, and communicating on their level, so. Hi, my name is Cami Leslie. I'm representing project and uh, production management. Um, superpowers, being open enough to understand people's needs, uh, in a project and trying to figure out the best way you can support that, uh, so being at the service of, of others. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, I'm Karen Walcott. I'm a technical director and production supervisor based in New York City. Uh, my superpower is that I have the power never to get smaller as I get further away. <laughs> um, I'm Roma Flowers. My specialty is lighting design. I would say my superpower is the ability to stay calm in the midst of pandemonium. Hi, uh, I'm Christina Benvenu. I'm stage manager, event stuff, TV, film more recently and long term. Uh, I'd have to say that my superpower is to quote, Galaxy Quest, never give up and never <laughs> surrender. Uh, and I find myself in a lot of challenges and challenging work environments every day, really, uh, in which I'm losing a battle, but I'm like, but I haven't lost the war yet. So that's, that's mine. Hi, I'm Amy Plant. I'm representing props. Um, my superpower is attracting electricity, like static shock, all the time. Um, but in a 
broader sense, um, it would have to be bringing levity to a situation <laughs> because sometimes that's all you need is just a little bit of levity and making everybody laugh to sort of move on from an awful situation. I'm Nicola Rossini. I'm here for themed entertainment, festivals, large-scale live events, and technology and storytelling. Um, I'm based out of Orlando, uh, but that's move 57, so pick the world. <laughs> My superpower is triage. Um, it, is, it is delineating what is the big picture and getting us moving forward um, with the secondary superpower of the power of why. I'm Molly McGinnis, I'm a costume designer, and I would imagine my superpower is having 44 years in my business and still loving it, and still working, and looking forward to new challenges. Hi, I'm Kristen Robinson, I'm a set designer and an educator, um, and I think my superpower is to assume anything I set my mind to is possible. Superpowers. <laughs> awesome, ladies. All right, so um, one of the, uh, two questions came up, um, and those questions were centered around mentorship and allies, and who who have in your careers been those those people that have empowered you, that have helped you succeed, and who you surround yourself with, and why. Um, so you could maybe tackle this question, but I think this is really important. Um, I was up in New York this past weekend um, with a bunch of alumni from the school, and the one thing that I heard over and over and over again was um, that, you know, having been at the school, having connected with people here, and connecting with them out in the industry had been so very powerful for them personally and for their careers. Um, and so maybe just open up the floor to talk about, to talk about that, who, is, who has been your ally, who has been your mentor, and why has that made such a difference for you? <laughs> um, I, can, I can start. Um, I've, had, I've been blessed with, I would say, two very important mentors in my life, and they've, uh, they've been, um, mentors at very distinct portions in my life, so they've served different purposes. But I think two underlying features of them both, one was my undergrad painting professor, his name was Sheldon Tapley, um, and one is the set designer Ricardo Hernandez. Um, and I think, one, yeah, two things that sort of made them so important. One is that they saw something in me. And I think as a young artist, you know, you're constantly sort of weighing your belief in yourself against like the world. And so to have somebody be like, no, I see something significant in you is very helpful to help you activate your own passion further, right? Beyond the sort of like self-activation, which I think is really uh, also important in this industry. I think the other thing is just they were so um, generous with their time and generous in terms of, um, really listening to my ideas and, and um, pushing against them and, um, you know, challenging me to think bigger than how I'd been thinking um, and exposing me to parts of the world that I hadn't necessarily been exposed to. Um, the, my painting professor, Sheldon, he, you know, I went to a liberal arts school in, in Kentucky and, um, you know, he was the first person who brought me to New York and showed me the art scene in New York, you know, and we spent hours in front of paintings um, and talking about that art and why it was important and uh, for a young person from the middle of the country to feel like New York suddenly became achievable in that way or that it was accessible, that really broke sort of my world open. Um, and Ricardo in the same way, but on a more um, specific vein in relationship to set design to be like, why do you think that about that play? Have you read this philosopher or seen this film? Or um, And to sort of have that open-ended creative conversation. Um, and I think, you know, there's been different points in my life where I've sort of struggled a little bit with like, oh, those haven't been female 
uh, models or female mentors, but I, I think mentors come in all shapes and sizes, and it, it's just you know finding somebody to really see you and I think challenge you is the most important feature, and people can serve different functions at different points in your life, too. Yeah. I, I also had a, a wealth of amazing mentors, um, from John Gottlieb at CalArts to Drew Delzell, who was a local sound designer in town that I met while I was in grad school. And um, what's amazing is both of them were so incredibly supportive of what I wanted to do and the kind of work I wanted to do. Um, again, with the, you know, the listening to me and what I was looking to do, and both of them were um, very assertive in introducing me to the, the community. Um, the number of times that Drew would say to a producer, I, I'm too busy to do your show, you should call Cricket. <laughs> like most of my work came from conversations like that, and John Gottlieb brought me to the taper, so I got to work in the, the big houses and worked as an assistant there. And you know, every designer that came through the taper in those two years, I got to work one-on-one -on -one with, and every one of them was supportive of me, not just while we were doing the show, um, but I could email them years later, and be like, I'm facing this contract question, or, or I'm dealing with this situation, I don't know how to handle it. And every one of them would email me back or call me back. Um, so, you know, uh, Darren West and Obadiah Eves and Mark Bennett and Michael Roth and all of them were incredibly supportive of me um, and encouraging me to, to challenge myself and find those projects and push myself and um, so it was not just learning from them but also like learning from myself and, and going out there and doing it. So it was amazing. I would like to jump in at what you are saying about they come at all kind of shapes and colors yeah. mentors like you can yeah. encounter them in your personal life mm -hmm. and these are key to you know help you to identify your strengths and your weaknesses and work on those and then i work mainly internationally and so you were talking about mentors and allies you know people that when you work in another in a foreign country and people don't speak the same language or anything and then they don't might not understand your culture and stuff but when you find the people that can help you achieve your goals or your project abroad because they understand you and they understand how you work and there's a trust that is created there. These are really very important people to keep, keep around mm -hmm. <laughs> and to, to, to foster that relationship. It's, it's really yeah. essential. Yeah. It could be in the workplace, but it's not always in the workplace. And if you can use that you know, and be giving, trusting and giving in that exchange, is, I think it's essential to accomplish what you have to do. Yes. Relationships are, are absolutely key, and you never know when the, uh, they're going to happen, you know, when you're going to meet somebody that's going to be instrumental, I think, in your career. I think there's a good point, too, to that your mentors aren't just in your career. They're in your life mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, one of my biggest mentors was the person who hired me first as a stage manager for a summer stock when I was in college. Um, and it wasn't planned. She happens to be an alum of the BA track in stage management in this program. Um, but more than any set of skills or paperwork that she taught me, and she taught me many, uh, was that she taught me to live with my heart forward. Um, she just, she's been a stage manager and company manager for 35 years, but she also just made her off-Broadway debut at second stage in Stephen Adley Gurgis's uh, Halfway Bidges Go Straight to Heaven. <laughs> like, she just did it. She went for it. Um, whatever that thing is, whether it's moving your family across country to chase a dream that you've decided is really worth it, or being really honest with um, yourself and saying, you know what, yeah, I've sunk 25 years into one track, but it's time to look at something else. I'm not growing. Um, her name's Christina Poe. I wholly recommend her anytime any of y'all are in New York. Um, the other was uh, actually an alum of my graduate school program who looked at me, um, we were 25 years apart, in the program, and he looked at me at an alumni event and went, you think weird and you're having a hard time. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> cool, give me a call when you're done, because I can use that. And that was um, my first bridge into theme parks. Um, I, I think the thing that's interesting about that, uh, and particularly with today's theme, when we talk about what later you look for in the people you surround yourself with, that can change. Mm -hmm. You know, that same person turned out to have some really problematic staffing patterns that years later I would have to look at and go, Doryu, as a person, learned a lot from you. 
cannot continue to work with you and support this because this is not a message I can put forward. Um, there's a saying that we are each the composite of the five people we spend the most amount of our time with. Um, and there have been some real times where I've had to look at these people who believed in me and gave me that, that mentor, you know, what we would think of as a classroom mentor track and went, I don't want to do that. I don't want to look like that. I don't want to be that. Um, and sometimes I wonder if they wish they hadn't given me the strength <laughs> to say that. Uh, but that your mentors change and what you're looking for mentoring in changes. And it's okay that tomorrow my mentor might actually be my intern because she's so out and loud and clear about who she is that it challenges me not to even hide or code switch where I don't need to. Well, I think also a thing that you're saying that's interesting is that, um, you know, I think when one considers mentorship, it always feels like, um, you know, an, an older and wiser person educating you, right, or just supporting you, but it's actually a, very much, a, I think, a two-way street where whether you realize it or not, you're feeding your mentor in some other capacity too, right? And I think that's what, again, makes it unique, that hopefully you're sort of co-inspiring each other in different ways, right? Some of the best mentorship you'll ever get in your life are the people sitting next to you right now in this room. That friend who has that kind of more sage tone when they're talking to you, and you're like, we're like, I'm five months older than you. Why are you talking to me like that? But, but they say the things that stick with you the most. And I, my best friend from grad school, Jamila, I have to plug her, uh, met her my first day and fly out to see her at least once a year and talk to her more than my own mother. And that's, those are the relationships that contribute to you in a significant way, just as you know, a, a, the ar archetype of mentor. So just keep that in mind too. So I think people, you know, kind of to to summarize, your your mentors or your allies or the people who are going to empower you in your career, they can pop up anywhere. They can be your family. They can be your friends. They can be the people that are sitting next to you, learning next to you. They can be your professors. They can be colleagues, they can be male, they can be female, they can be, you know, you know it, it is, but what I, what I did hear over, you know, to this side is that it, it's important to look for somebody that, that aligns with your values and that that may change over time and it's good to be conscious about that um, and looking for that. So um, we're going to move on to the next question which um, is, can you think of a time, and I'd like everybody to answer this question, because I think <laughs> this is, you know, why, why we're here today. Can you think of a time when you were discriminated against or discounted as a woman in the industry, and what did you do to overcome it? Mm. I'm gonna go, let's <laughs> just walk down the aisle. Oh, okay. Um, I think the first time that I encountered something like that um, was actually where I wasn't expecting it. Sometimes it's in the oddest places. And so it was for, you are a professional, you're working uh, in the South, and I got the impression that they thought that no one was skilled in the South in your profession. And I was kind of taken back and I said, hmm, so my answer was, I said, I'm going to let them see as much of my resume and my portfolio as possible and answer all the questions they do not know. Because somewhere along the line, that has been attached. If you actually are living in the South, that you might not be as skilled as your counterparts in other areas. Because I was kind of shocked. It wasn't even just about being a female. Um, which can be quite often more than you think. And so someone said, well, how do you fix that? I said, well, my resume on IMDB, and my resume is very long, <laughs> <laughs> very long. So I remove all doubt. So then we can move on, because that's another way of taking care of it, and it's in a very good light. Because you're answering the question, no one wants 
to have someone who does not have the skill set that they need to be able to rely on them because that is your right hand to make the piece really, really good for the production because um, you make the whole department look good. So if you work together cohesively and you have the confidence that they can handle it, then it makes everybody look good. But I know from there that every time they encounter someone that might be from the South or that works, they're going to think first about it and say, wait, let me just look at their credentials and look at their resume. They're not going to think that first. And so that is something that I have always done and tried to do because everywhere I go, I try to educate a little bit that there's more here than you think. There's more to the person. You just have to lay it out there for them. And you can do it in a very nice way. <laughs> um, I've encountered some exciting moments um, over the last couple of years. Um, I would say the combination of um, being female and also looking very young um, can be a pretty big detriment. Um, walking into a lot of situations, people assume that I won't be able to manage a crew, that I might not know what I'm doing, and the way that I counteract that usually is by trying to show up as composed as possible, um, having everything sorted before I walk into a job site, mm -hmm. and doing the best I can and working the hardest I can. Um, and it's not always the most fun answer. <laughs> um, but ultimately, um, if you show up and you are good at your job and you are the best at your job, the people who do not see you as equal will look stupid. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> And ultimately, you earn the respect of the people who matter, um, and the people who will advance your careers, and the people who will trust you with bigger and larger things in the future. I um, I mean, like I can think of instances where I was out, um, you know, went up to the, you know, I was out in a new place, went up to the house sound guy, and started talking about all the stuff that needs to get set up and. You know, and his response is like, oh, well, we'll deal with that when the sound guy shows up. It's like, I am the sound guy. <laughs> um, but for me, I, you know, the way I handle stuff like that, is, I, you know, my attitude is I, I will treat everybody with the respect that I expect to receive. So if I treat these people with respect, if I treat them, if I don't assume that they don't know what they're doing, I can expect the same in return. And I have found that... Um, for the most part, that's been very true. That, uh, you know, the crews treat me with respect. I show them that I know what I'm doing. I show them that I'm confident. Um, and, and they don't question that. Uh, you know, I know what I'm doing. And I don't question it, so they shouldn't either. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah the f I think the first thing I remember, the first event I remember, it's, uh, I was working abroad uh, in China. And uh, I was the executive producer for the festival I was producing at the time. And I was also the interpreter for my partner, the artistic uh, producer, which is my husband. And we were working. And so I was translating Chinese to English. And I would go, we go to meetings with, you know, government people or founders. And, and, uh, and they will always answer to my husband. And I was like, well, I had introduced myself as the executive producer, but still, they would always look at him and not talk to me at all. And I was like, okay, after a while, I get a little bit tiring. And so we decided that um, we would just sit in a certain way in the room and then make sure that they understand they have to answer back to me as much as to my partner. Uh, and then we start to develop strategies on how to address that and make sure that things were exposed and presented from the beginning where I'm going to take care of this, this, and that, and he's going to take care of this, this, and that, exposing the the task and the responsibilities and trying to get over it, but still keeping things calm. <laughs> I think the big thing is always to answer back to those situations just as you would like them to answer to you and just keep on moving, just keep on doing what you have to do, uh, being, being clear. Um, so I think for me, I've had a very long freelance career. And so for me, it's encountering it again and again and again because I'm working with a different group of people all the time and when you freelance you're consistently interviewing for the next gig so you're constantly in these situations where you're sitting across the room from a man who's asking you questions um, I've been interviewed by very few women in my life uh, for any position and you know things will happen in interviews like a guy grabbed my hand once and said you know your nails are really pretty you're not gonna be able to keep them like that here 
Um, and you know, to that, I just say, dude, look at my resume. Like, I'm a carpenter. I'm a you know lighting technician. Like, get off it. Um, <laughs> like, obviously, um, you know, I'm not gonna have this nice manicure all the time, uh, depending on what position I have. Um, so for me, I've kind of learned to not internalize it, not take it personally, expect that it's gonna happen on occasion, and I just firmly correct the person if I feel uncomfortable with something they said or did. Uh, it took me a long time to get there. Uh, I was very shy when I started my career, and it was hard for me to talk uh, to people very directly like that, but, um, you know, these days I work, um, I have a full-time job, so I'm, you know, luckily in a place that's very open and um, accepting of all cultures, but, you know, eventually I'll probably go back to freelancing, and I think that just remaining uh, true to myself everywhere I go is really important to me because I'm also very aware that I'm trying to make it better for the next generation coming up. And I, you know, if I can shut down one jerk tomorrow and maybe he won't make the same mistake again, that makes me feel a little bit better. But um, yeah, it just, it's a constant fight, um, especially in freelance. When I was a very, 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 very young designer, I was still living in Chicago, and I went to a lighting supply house to pick up some gel. And a friend who had mentioned to me that there was a job opening in the shop of this, this lighting house. So as I was in there purchasing gel and speaking with a salesperson, who I also knew was the manager of the company, I said, and I also hear that you have a job opening in the, in the shop, and I would like to interview for it. And he said, okay, well, let's interview right now. And I realized at that moment I had put myself in a situation that I could not control. I had no resume on me, I, and I was so young and inexperienced. I should have said, no, we will not have an interview right now. Let's set up a time where I can come back and be prepared for this. But I didn't. So, of course, I kind of stumbled through. And I think he had no intention whatsoever of even considering me as a candidate for it. What that taught me, as I said, was taking control of those kind of situations where assumptions might be made about my lack of experience or lack of qualifications to be sure that I could present exactly what my qualifications were. I'm going to use a somewhat more recent example. Um, I left a job, it's the third job I've ever quit, um, last August, September, October, September. October, um, and um, uh, it was my last day, and um, they had the guy who was gonna replace me, because of course it was a guy, because there was only two girls at that point working on this uh, uh, TV show. I'll leave it nameless for now. Um, and uh, he was supposed to kind of shadow me and just kind of get a sense of, of what was going on, and you know, I've, I've been, stage manager too, so I'm like, oh, here are a lot of things that are gonna be really pertinent and helpful to you in just being successful because there are things that I figured that I just needed to do. He wasn't really paying me much mind, like he was buddies with my bosses, they go way back, and I was like, okay, whatever, and I think he didn't understand the terms of me leaving, because I was leaving, not because I was being fired, like I was leaving because I had an issue with benefits that they were not giving us, and I was like holding my ground on it, everyone knew, everyone wasn't happy that I was leaving, but they understood it, it was an amicable breakup. Um, and so he was following me around, and there were a lot of points during the evening where he'd try to just do my job, and I just didn't have it. <laughs> uh, and I would just, I just ignored a lot of what he was doing, a lot of what he was saying. And he wasn't a bad guy and he wasn't rude or anything like that. He just was doing what a lot of men in male-dominated industries do, which is stuff on top of women. Uh, and that just didn't really set well with me. And it was something that throughout the day became very clear to him without me having to say anything because a lot of crew members would still come to me, even though he'd be going to them about stuff, and they'd be like, oh, I need to talk to Christina. I can't talk to you, sorry. 
which you know is a little satisfying um, in those moments. But the real point of confrontation happened at the end of the night. Um, there's a lot of payroll type paperwork I had to do with that job, and I was going through all these vouchers for these extras, and they were all wrong. Uh, and he had been really like, let me sign out, the picture card people, like, you handle set, I wanna help you out, blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, I'm quite capable of signing him out and running set, I've been doing it for the past three months, so. But okay, you could help me out, that's fine. And then we got back to our holding space and I was going through the paperwork and I was like, what did you do? This is missing their social security number, like this is the wrong out time, these are the correct hours, this is missing signatures, we have to forge this, like, I mean, it's fine, like this kind of errors happen all the time, but like not in this magnitude, and now we're gonna be here for another half hour because you tried to help me out. Um, and I was just like very clear of my standard of work and that he didn't meet it. Uh, and, um, but here's what we were gonna do to fix it, and it, it was very non-confrontational. It was just, I, I find in those situations it's always helpful to be as matter of fact as possible, and then also understand what you're trying to achieve. I was leaving this job, the chances of us working together again were very slim, uh, and I had, not, I, didn't, I didn't need to fix him, and I didn't need to fix this moment, but I did for myself need to know what I was worth and that some of that behavior that occurred was not working for me. Um, and being able to communicate about that and still work and still get the job done, there's a lot of balls you're juggling and it's not always easy and sometimes you just decide that you don't want to say anything because it's just not worth it for you in that moment. You're not going to gain anything because you already lost something. So. That's. Um, props is more like female dominated than male generally. Um, so it's, it hasn't been a huge problem in my career, um, but as I have moved up in some of my jobs, um, younger male prop people will come in and not believe me when I'm talking to them which has been the biggest problem that I've had. And it gets to a point where I just, I've finally gotten to a point where I can just say something and if they don't believe me, it's not on me. I can't make them believe me. Like if I tell you to do a job and you think I'm wrong, that's not on me. It's going to reflect poorly on the other person. And eventually, usually if I'm working with them for a while, usually at like at a summer stock is the biggest problem that I've been having, like by the end of the summer, they'll recognize that anyone who's been at this job for more than a year, you should probably listen to them even if they're <laughs> female. Our shop <clears throat> is almost all women at our summer stock, which is kind of awesome, but I've had apprentices come in and literally like go up the food chain trying to get a different answer, but it's like this woman and then this woman and then this woman and this woman are all going to give you the same answer. Um, but it took me several years to get used to it, but it's like you can speak firmly and if, if they don't believe you, just kind of, you just gotta let it go. I could try and make a teachable moment, but usually those don't, will backfire a lot of times because then they feel like they're being made an example of. And I try to avoid that kind of drama. So, I mean, I'm always willing to talk to someone like to the side, but generally I just try and think it's not on me. I can do what I can and if they don't take that, that's their, their problem. <laughs> I didn't want to answer this question. <laughs> um, well, because the, there's, there's that point where everybody has a story. Everybody has 12. So where, where do you want to start? Mm -hmm. um, what's, what I can offer that's not been spoken on is 
I know which slurs apply to me in Arabic, Mandarin, Cantonese, Japanese, and Bahasa. Um, and that's a thing. And that, for me, was something I walked in prepared for that my coworkers did not. Um, there are rooms that you inhabit where you are not welcome, but they need your talent. And I always stick with that. There's a reason somebody's flown me 3,000 miles to deal with this. Yes, I'm the one who's here. Do you want to be done? Or do you want to argue about getting somebody else out here? Um, in the larger, I've spent a lot of time on construction sites the last 15 years. Fill in the blank. It's happened. I've seen it. Um, for me, the question of how do you overcome it almost takes the wrong tactic. You can't always fight the system that is not in your favor. Um, and I'm sorry to say that, but you can undermine the fuck out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and that may help you sleep at night a little better. <laughs> so some tactics for that. Um, yeah, I'm going to name check this. Let's see if they call me out on my NDA for this. Uh, I delivered Pandora, the world of Avatar, at Walt Disney World. Everybody knows Disney's standards, right? How many of you have heard about the rider on the Disney tours with the haircuts and the, and the no swearing and the no tattoos and all of that? Right? This isn't unheard of. Yeah, check the port johns on any of their sites. They're not accommodating and they're not welcoming. And they're full of things that make people want to cry. But here's one of the things you can do. I don't like walking into swastikas. I don't like walking into horrible slurs about women. I don't like what, it, it was the middle of an election. There was a lot of things about there. You know who else doesn't? My VFX crew full of dudes. All male, all white. All of them looked at me and said, this is horrible. We need to go somewhere else. And I was like, yeah, here's the other bathroom that we can get you to. But then I taught them about the gift of feminism, which is they get to be uncomfortable too. It's like, don't put my name in it. Don't put any of the other women's name in it. Don't put any of those things in. Just file the complaint that you don't like it. That's all you got to do. Let's talk with your truth. We had the same problem with a paint charge on a different site. Other vendors were giving her hell, and she's been at it. She's one of the best scenic paint artists in the world, hands down. She's been at it for 45 years. She started at Imagineering when she was 19. She has come up doing everything perfectly. She's not interested in filing that complaint or having it. But slowly I taught every other dude on the site who was like, yeah, I can't get her to file a complaint. She doesn't have to. All you have to do is stand in your truth and say, I don't like being on a site where somebody on my team is being spoken to like that. You don't have to name her name, you just have to call out the vendor to bring it up on their standards. That's where I go around it. Um, I have a, a collaborator um, who is affectionately known as my dildo <laughs> because he noticed that we were in meetings and I would say something and it would get blown past and somebody else would bring it up but bring it up wrong and I would have to jump in and fix what they were misappropriating into the correct path of action. And finally, he walks in, and he closes the door, and he goes, they're not listening to you. And I said, yeah, I know. And he was like, how are we going to fix that? And I was like, well, there's a couple of things about this. Do you want to be right, or do you want to be effective? Because <laughs> that's also the question. And I'm a lot of times more driven by the end result. And I said, here's the thing. Every time I say it, you say it. It's that simple. Every time, he was like, what do, what do you even call that? And I was like, a beard? Dildo. <laughs> You're just saying what I'm saying with it. Like, he's like, you don't, I don't have your specialties. I don't know how to make that plan. I was like, you don't have to. Literally say whatever words just came out of my mouth, and then we'll get the conversation on track. It's not the fun way to go about it, but gosh, are we known as a team that gets things done. And gosh, is that my name that is known as a person who gets things done. So it comes around on the other side, and that's what I would offer. I think that bystander piece mm -hmm. is really important. Like when we're in environments um, and we say something that is important and we say something that is right and it is being ignored um, or it is being passed by or it's causing conflict, it's important for 
those people that are around us to do their part. Mm -hmm. um, that makes a huge, huge difference. Yep. Yeah. What she said, I mean, it's <laughs> <laughs> I, like you, I've been the only woman in the room a lot in my career. And I think what someone said down there as well, you're, best defense is to be the smartest, the most prepared, the most professional, the one that's not gossiping, not creating weird scenarios at work that are dramatic. You're the problem solver. You're the one who gets things done. You're the one the director looks at and said, you're the only one I trust here to do everything right. I don't have to keep looking over my, your shoulder to make sure you're doing it right. And, of course, I'm older, so people treat me differently than a younger woman. But I, I am encouraged what I see in television now, particularly. Uh, and I know a lot of female producers who are engaged in trying to bring women to direct, which is huge glass ceiling to break. And the biggest camera grips electric construction. It's like that glass ceiling, I'm seeing it start to shatter. And I'm very encouraged by it. And I see female directors mentoring other directors. So I feel very optimistic. I think the Me Too movement has settled a lot of guys down a little bit with their behavior because they're afraid. And that gives us power. But I think sometimes when things get really rowdy in a room, I lower my voice and speak very definitively and I see guys lean in and they're listening to me. And I think you have to engender respect by your professionalism. There's no way around it. It's like women have to do better than men to get there. It's, a, it's the way it is right now. I was laughing about the IMDB because I was doing a show in Chicago, television show, and we had to do this courtroom scene with all these extras. It was supposed to be Europe. And the young second AD had placed these people right up front who looked horrible. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, you, you, and you, let me have you move back. I'm like, sir, would you move forward, madam? Would you? So I'm moving everyone around. And this young guy comes up to me and he's like, you can't do that. And I said, I am doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, and he backed up, and luckily the UPM downloaded my credits, had him in his office, and made him read them out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Which was very nice and very supportive. You can't always count on that support, but yeah, I think by strength of personality, you know, I am doing the right thing here, and people respect you for it. So. You have to exude confidence and be prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I feel like for me, the thing I think about the most is instead of like a singular incident, I just think about a basic durational level of work that you have to tack on. So, um, you know, which I think most of us have already sort of touched on that sense of having to come in an extra 10% more advanced on your game than your male colleagues. Um, and so for me, I think the thing, the little mantra I keep in my head is like, don't get tired. <laughs> you know, like don't get tired of always being the most professional, knowing the, the equipment and the language of the environment that you're working in as much as your um, often for me, older male colleagues. Um, I also really loved what you were saying about voice. Um, I think, 
developing the voice that makes people do things for yourself, like (laughs) truly learning what is your power voice. um, Mm -hmm. So people hear you um, is a really important skill to test out. Um, And I think also, I feel like if I can make people feel seen, like if I, truly make a room where people feel seen, then often that comes back to me in a good way. And I think that often the colleagues that I'm working with are are stressed out and tired, and if I can imbue the collaboration with um, some element of inspiration or a sense of mutual respect and kindness, then often if something starts in like an antagonistic relationship, over time, I've developed some of the best allies and comrades through that act of kindness and inspiration. And know everybody's name and try not to forget it, which I'm really bad at, but (laughs) really, you know, like know what's going on in people's lives and see them, yeah. Don't get tired. (laughs) Keep, Keep trying to keep that standard high and don't give up, really, yeah. I think everybody has has kind of talked about the fact that, I mean, you need to be on top of your game and and not allow any room for somebody, you know, to come in and and doubt your worth, Um, whether that's doing what you're doing or the way that you're presenting yourself and the confidence in yourself. Um, But one thing that, that has been across the board is is this idea of emotional intelligence. So, you know, you've all talked about the fact that, you know, as these things have come across, you know, your career, that you've had to take a step back and say, okay, I'm letting this wash over me and this is how I choose to react and I choose to react with respect. I choose to react with my competence. Um, my heart and um, and make spaces where other people you know are going to come along and see that and see my value here Um, but that's that's a big thing and there were there were several questions that were presented about um, you know how do we not get emotional how do we navigate being maybe the only person in this space um, so I think that, that that was, for me, what really rung out and what everybody said. Um, so there were a couple of questions that had to do with, um, you know, how do we choose to be authentic to ourselves and, and not be influenced? you know, by, by, thing, by pressures and things like that. And, and some of those questions came out um, in, you know, I'll, I'll just read one of them. What are some ways to, in, to avoid diluting our femininity in the workplace um, in order to gain respect? Um, there was another one um, that had to do with how do, how do we change the way that, do, or do we need to change the way that we talk? or how we communicate. Um, and, and for me, that all just kind of boiled down to how do we be authentically who we are um, in, in the spaces in which we're working when there might be pressures around us. Um, anybody want to tackle that? Yeah. I have some thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so obviously I, uh, I have bright blue hair, which is not the biggest deal in the world, but I also um, tend to come off fairly young. Uh, I'm 37 and I get a lot of folks thinking I'm in my early 20s, just out of gra- uh, undergrad, you know, stuff like that, which also then confers a certain skill level. And um, I, for a long time, when I would go on job interviews, I would dye my hair brown, or I would, you know, get rid of the crazy glasses, or really try to look like what, what I was applying for. But, you know, I learned over time that there is no right look for that. There is no thing that you should be to be in a position. Um, you know, I dress professionally, um, you know, sometimes with crazy colors also, but 
that's, that should be the extent of it. And I know that that's a very surfacey thing, but if I tried to make myself look normal, tried to make myself look older, it just wouldn't feel right and it doesn't feel right. And so I've been very lucky that I've been able to maintain, you know, sort of a, a sense of my own style, which again, not the most pressing issue of our times, um, but you know, I think it might apply to other, um, other facets of work as well. You know, I don't, um, I don't try to sound like a man. I don't try to sound like someone older, you know, all of that. Um, and just being unapologetically myself uh, has gotten me, I think, pretty far. Uh, so I hope others can, can take that away from this as well. I think it's important not to let your ego run away with you, that you kind of have it in control. And I know like the question of dressing appropriately comes up a lot. And when I teach, I do talk to people about it. And I always say because of my profession as a costume designer, I always want to put that actor at ease that I'm not upstaging them. So I tend to be like neutral professional, so no one makes an assumption about me. And I mean, it's, I can dress the way I want when I'm at home, I can wear sweatpants all the time. But when I'm at work, I think I dress in a, more conservatively than probably a lot of younger people, but I feel like it suits me. And it suits my relationship to the people I'm dealing with. I think a lot of it has to do with um, being intelligent about the different spaces that you're in. I mean, like as a set designer, um, and like I like dresses, I'm wearing a dress today, but I'm not having to climb on a ladder right. and, <laughs> and like, you know, get down and dirty making paint samples with my scenic artist. And so, you know, like, wear the clothes that you like that make sense for the surroundings that you're in in that environment. I always kind of laugh at myself because I feel like in a tech process, I literally have a very clear like timeline of clothing that I wear, whereas like the first three days are 100% like pants and like shirts that I don't mind getting a little dirty. And I always like <laughs> a shoe with a punctuative sound because I feel like that can be a helpful subconscious way of running a room. <laughs> little, little, little trick. <laughs> um, you know, like shoes that make you work, walk with purpose. Um, but then, like by preview, it's like great. I don't have to climb that ladder, so I'm gonna wear a dress and something. You know, like it's about that kind of just evolving with what is necessary at the time. And I think also being conscious of that. Similar to Karen, you know, people really think I'm like. 20 and also in you know my 30s uh, in environments where I think I might have to project a, another level of seriousness sort of trying to up my professional whatever my professional attire is still within the sort of like personality constraints of myself um, but understanding that people just we're very visual and so people read things about you and so I think you can you you can just be smart about the different rooms that you're in. I also think it's worth noting that um, some of our differences as genders can be real um, benefits that I think in many ways I feel like some of my most uh, st some of my strengths is actually again being um, fairly emotionally transparent like that bringing um, bringing my feeling to work can be helpful um, and again sort of inspiring or um, that I care in that way or that I'm willing to share that part of myself and that can be sometimes um, again that doesn't always work or doesn't always have a, a useful experience but I think sometimes being that can be very wonderful and that you don't necessarily have to feel like you have to build this at least I haven't felt like I've had to build necessarily a facade of um, some other personality, I think mm -hmm. the emotion that I have to struggle with the most to find its vehicle is anger. 
anger is the one that is the most tricky to know how to channel because it's the, the, the least received uh, yeah. from our gender. And it comes with the most amount of baggage. So I find that I've sort of lost my ability to get uh, outwardly angry. It's a very deep internal anger. <laughs> <laughs> And that is, again, in terms of like the question we were on before, like a duress that you have to f kind of figure out when, when are those key moments when yelling is like actually useful. It's about 1% of the time I've found. True. Yeah. True. Um, I, you, you really just got to own it, that period. <laughs> you just got to own how you want to look, how you want people to perceive you. Are you comfortable with that message? and you need to think about it. And, and you can change, and it's okay. And you can, we're all impressionable, and we learn things from other people. And I like to wear lipstick every day, and I also like to run the hell out of a set. So I don't feel the need to change either part of myself, and it's hard, and people do think that I work with wardrobe 90% of the time and not with production, yeah. and that can be frustrating, but you know, I'm the person they ask for a rap estimate from at the end of the day, not, not somebody else. And it's, and it's a long, it's a long thing that I, that I didn't figure out in a day. And I tried different things and I look, but I, you know, at the end of it, I like looking, I like looking put together and I like thinking about what I wear. And I also like to read John Don as well. So like, you know, do with it what you will. You just have to be confident in it and just know and think about it. Own it thoughtfully. Um, in hair and makeup, depending on if you're going from film or if you're doing TV or if you're doing, uh, maybe you're doing a commercial video and the setting of the, the individuals that you're dealing with, we kind of get a little bit different because in the first 30 seconds, they're judging your skills, how well, um, how well you work with people, and uh, how your items are set up. So in a, a corporate America for a video, I'll dress differently because I want them to see I'm on the same level that they are. I'll give you that professionalism that you're looking for because they can get a little nervous if they see something too far to the left or too far to the right. It has nothing to do with it. It's just their world. Whereas um, on a film and we're on location and we're working in a cornfield with dirt, bugs, and mud, you need to dress appropriate because you're in heat, you're in mud, you want to keep the bugs off of you, you want to be able to do your job and do it well, whether you're down in the mud cleaning them up and you've got feet shots, you're cleaning feet, you got to be able to clean yourself up, you got an extra set of clothes to change into because, oh, you just got drenched in, uh, this isn't good, I need, I keep extra sets, you'll see me with more. Depending upon if a strange storm comes out of nowhere and <laughs> You just got drenched. You got to have all your wares to switch into because maybe everything you've got on is soaking wet. I've been where there has been uh, a tornado warning and a storm, and we're on a flip plane. And we're in a tent. Let's just put it there, you know. And the center pole is moving where we're filming our actors, and there are wild animals in there. And I'm watching the flap suck, and I'm watching the pole move, and I'm going, okay, my bag, I'm grabbing my raincoat, I'm changing myself, I'm grabbing my stuff because I'm looking for the exit because I'm going, this is going to be short, and I want to make sure I live through this, you know, and nobody's still calling it. And then, you know, about the third time you see the pole move, you're going, okay. I start easing toward the exit. They haven't told us that we can quite go yet, but I'm easing toward the exit because you've got to have some sense about where you are. So, and people are looking at you in the makeup department. They expect you to be prepared for everything. They ask you for everything. I mean, whatever's for the skin, they've got a boo-boo, they've got a headache. Do you have it? I'll say, there's a medic. If I don't, I've got it. I've got it backed up. So when you leave and you get, you get out there and you can't see your feet in front of you and you soak down, you're going, okay, where's the van? Let me find the road up. I don't want to be down here to get up there. You find the van. As you're going up, you've got other people in the department 
they may not have had theirs. And so I'm grabbing like this going, okay, we're going this way, you know. Uh, and you're being told that if it gets any closer, go out the right side of the tent and jump in the ditch and hold onto a tree root. What clothes did you bring? Okay, <laughs> I'm just telling you what clothes. I'm going, did they really say that? Now, as you notice that when you were going down to set, that they're fire ant heels and they've got gators. I'm going, hmm, okay, which way I'm gonna go? You have to think about what you bought with you, so I'll carry a pack and it'll have different clothes. Well, I ended up not using it for myself because I bought my raincoat and I had my other. But the person who was in the other department who was pretty much petrified, I said, here, here's a sweatshirt, here's a hat, et cetera, to dry yourself and pull yourself together. I take my clothes for whatever is being anticipated that the weather can change because when you're working outside, nothing stays the same. If I'm in um, on a, a TV set and I know that I'm working with you know, a network, I'm gonna dress where I look professional because they expect you to look as professional as possible to say, I know what I'm doing with my job. I'm not just here for fluff, I know what I'm doing. I want them to feel confident in me and what I'm doing. And that is something that you cannot take away. You wanna make sure that you like who you are and you make them comfortable with who you are and you have the skill set to match it. And if you do that, you'll love what you're doing and they'll love you, they'll call you for everything. So be practical, mm -hmm, definitely. be you, um, and understand the context and I think within which you're, with, within which you're yeah. operating, but, but yeah. be you. True um, authenticity. Yeah. Like that's, that's the thing where I see this get tripped up the most. I've actually been coached to be more feminine as the years have gone. Then like I'm the only person who I know who's had that particular one of like, yeah, you're kind of coming up. And I was like, okay, well, what does that even mean? Right. And you start pushing it. Um, it's, it's what, um, what we were saying about own it. If you're, wor if you're starting to worry about diluting your femininity, stop and ask yourself why that particular item is the seat of your femininity before you put it on the jacket. Own that. Own who you are. Visible orange makes everybody look awful. It's the great equalizer. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, the, you know, there were a couple of questions that had to do with, um, with inclusivity. Um, you know, uh, there were, there were I'll, I'll read the questions. Um, one was, what are some, uh, for, for women of color, what are some of your experiences being a woman of color in the industry, and do you have advice on what I will face and how I should prepare myself? Um, there was another one that had to do with, you know, how, how do we make our industry more accessible um, for different backgrounds and how do we get more diverse communities involved in our industry? Um, and then there was a, a, question, um, a question about gender fluidity and how we can be more inclusive um, in, in the spaces in which we operate. So those are three maybe different questions, but for me they all had to do with, with inclusion. And I'd love for a couple of you to answer any of those. I spoke about this in the, in the lighting class earlier today. Um, I walked into a backstage room. It was unexpected that I would be arriving there. And I walked into my technician saying, well, we'll have to wait until the head nigga in charge gets in here. I was speechless. I just moved to Texas from New York. All I could do at that moment was turn and walk out. And I had to walk around the block and I had to smoke a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to go back there that day because work, work had to be done in the theater. I walked back to the theater, I did my job probably with a sharpness of tone that was clear <laughs> how I felt enunciating everything. But I didn't directly confront the individuals that, or the one individual that was saying this to another. Um, got through my work of the evening. The next day I went to my boss and explained the situation. Um, I wish I had dealt with that differently. 
I wish I had made a formal complaint. This is an educational institution. I wish I had made a formal complaint to HR. And I would now, a few years later. As a woman of color, yeah. Person of color, yeah. Sometimes you will get that. How will you handle it? With poise and grace. Um, but I would say, call upon your institution to remedy it as quickly as you can. Document it, um, speak to it about your colleagues, find out who's your ally in that kind of situation, but don't let it go. Yeah. It's hard, it's hard. I'm, I'm not a woman of color, <laughs> maybe a big, a big red right now, but, um, but I, I, I've been a, a minority, you know, living, living in, in countries where you're, you're not um, a majority. And then how you fit in and how you can make sense of who you are and what you do within that, you know, in, in places we're talking about dress codes, in places where women have to dress totally differently, you, you're not allowed. You know, it's not just a, can you? It's like, you're not allowed to do it. So then you have to think about how you integrate, how can you fit in, and if you organize teams or if you're managing teams and having to bring teams within that context, how do you protect them? How do you create a safe environment in which they can all do their work without uh, those differences becoming uh, a blocking and difficulties for you to, 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 to do your job? And it's not always easy. But I think that communication, you know, being tolerant and creating that, you can, you know, you have regulations all over the world. I mean, each country and each place, institution will have their regulations. Trying to get those, understand what they are, and use that into your advantage to make sure that everybody is aware, okay, that's the, these are the, the, the rules of the game. <laughs> We're playing these, these together, and we need to make sure that this, there is respect there and uh, understanding according to where you are and what you do. It's important. Mm -hmm. I, I really encourage you to find your community, find your tribe, find your people. It's it, being a person of color in the industry can be incredibly isolating. Um, and, and, and you know, and, it, and you don't always have it's not always something that you have to think about. Like just because you identify as a woman and you are a person of color doesn't mean it has to be something that you think about every day that you necessarily want to think about at work every day. And oftentimes when we're put in these instances, we didn't have the choice. Someone threw that in our face. This is who you are and by the way, it sucks. And you're grappling with how to navigate those situations and part of how you navigate that, besides saying something or not, and that choice is yours always, is having your tribe, having your collective. You know, when I was on Orange is the New Black, strangely for a show about diversity, there was a very, very lack of it in the production crew. And um, me and the sound mixer, who was black, uh, started the... <laughs> The, the African American Coalition, and we would have meetings at a sound cart, and we would have, you know, these like brief moments of something really fucked up just happened to me when I was over there. I heard so and so say this about this. How do you feel about it? And we would have these dialogues, and we'd be able to kind of get it off our chest and then decide if between the two of us, if we felt that it was a situation worth escalating or not. And if I didn't have him, then I don't, I don't quite know what I would have done on a job like that. So find your tribe, find your tribe. One, one thing that I, since I'm a, um, an educator, one thing that I really try to do is be very transparent with my um, students about my own experience. Um, uh, just because I felt like, you know, I've, again, I've had really wonderful mentors and teachers who are male, but they, it's just a different experience. And so really being unashamed of sharing difference in, in experience and um, being very clear about that with my students and, and the young women that I'm around. Um, I also think another thing sort of 
uh, I've been doing more and more lately is in collaborations with male colleagues when the content is about um, you know, a female experience, again, just being transparent about what I've experienced, not feeling like I shouldn't share something troubling or something difficult, and instead just being very clear about what that experience is like, um, just to make it not a secret or not like this thing that's in the background. It's just like, no, this is, this is the way I feel. This is how I've felt before. So you should know that. And just, yeah, being open about that. Um, so I want to be, we're kind of getting to um, the end of our time, um, and so there's, there's one, I think, one thing that we can do sort of quickly if we go down the line that's going to, to leave, um, you know, uh, some nuggets <laughs> um, of, of information for who is listening to us today. And so the question is, um, what is one thing that you would tell upcoming women that you wish someone had told you when you started. Um, and, you know, that can be, you know, or, or, I'd, or I'd open it up to you to, um, you know, give some, some resource um, that might be valuable. But what is that one nugget that you want to leave here today? We're going to start on the other end. And um, if, if, yep, we're going to go in, in one or two sentences, what would it be? Um, I think I, this wasn't something that I lacked of or, or missed at an early age, but something that I, I feel like I see in a lot of young women around me um, is just to name that you're, you're a person of value and significance. Mm -hmm. And that really, again, kind of like going back to my superpower, it's like if you set your mind to something, even if it seems out Landish, it's not outlandish. That whatever those hidden desires are that you have that feel like a secret, that is of value and significance and you should go after it with as much hunger and passion as you are willing to give it. I think I wish I had had better advice or any advice on how to deal with really difficult people. <laughs> I think it, it's, it's, be it's, I know. it's a huge <laughs> thing, how to control your own emotions so that you are playing the game and you are ahead in the game. So I wished as a young person, maybe I had gotten better advice on that. I actually got a lot of really good advice when I was younger, um, but the one thing that it took me way too long to learn is your soul is huge and you need to find multiple channels to fill it, <laughs> and all of those will eventually make the other things better. Don't rely just on whatever current artistic path is to be the one thing forever and to be the only thing, because the only way you develop that is by all the other things that interest and develop you. Um, I think if someone had told me it's okay to be emotional, like I know that we get a lot of flack for being emotional, but even if it's not being emotional at your job, having people, a group that you can go to and just like, vent all of your frustration to, that's okay. You need to feel things is fine. You can do that. It's okay. Um, I wish I knew that some walls are made of brick and you can't actually break them or go through them, but you can go around them and you can climb over them and dig under but there's some things that are just that you can't change. And so you have to decide how to adapt to that. And it is okay to change your mind. You're not committed to anything or anybody or any job or any classification or identity. You can change your mind at any time of your life and be whoever you want, whenever you want. And it's an evolving process and that doesn't change when you're 30, isn't change when you're 
plus 50, whatever, it's, it's okay. And, and it's, and it's going to be an interesting and sometimes not fun process, but it'll, it'll never stop. I think I wish someone had told me that as I was developing as a young professional, I had to keep an idea of myself that was not just this profession, that I wasn't just a lighting designer, or that or I was a lighting designer, <laughs> and recognize I was this whole person. And there are lots of different parts to me, not just the lighting designer part to me. And that I needed to nurture those parts as much as I nurtured myself as a professional. And as much as I developed and strove to develop as that artistic professional, I needed to give attention to those other parts as well. Uh, I had a delusion when I was younger that sexism in the industry would be somehow better or less noticeable as I rose up the ladder. And uh, I'm here to tell you it doesn't get better necessarily, it just gets sneakier and smarter and more insidious. <laughs> but what's going to happen is that you're going to get better at recognizing it and reacting to it over time. So I, I hope that that gives you some hope. It will get easier. <laughs> It's not an easy question. <laughs> it's not an easy question. <laughs> I think that uh, trust your skills and trust what you've learned when you're here, you know, at school, whatever, whatever you learn throughout your projects, and trust your intuitions. You know, we often say, oh, women's intuition, and, you know, we have whatever ability over a man, or I'm not sure if it's true here or not, but um, trust that intuition, because often that little voice that you have inside of you uh, it's, it's, it's really important, and so don't forget about it. Mm -hmm. um, I found myself when I was young having to constantly remind myself that I was invited to be a part of this team. They wanted me on this team, they chose me, someone chose me, the producer, the director, and they want my voice, and it's okay for me to speak my voice, and it's okay if my voice is different than the rest of the team. They brought me on for that reason, they brought me on because I belong in that room. Um, so you belong in the room. <laughs> um, that it's okay to communicate the way that is the most effective and authentic to yourself. Um, I think people are very quick to, in particular, tell women um, whether they are going to be taken seriously if they sound angry, if they sound funny. Um, but that you should speak in the way that you are most confident speaking, in the way that you are most effective communicating. And if that involves apologizing, if that involves an exclam exclam exclamation point, it's nobody else's business. <laughs> um, I think for me, it would be that in that moment when it's the worst moment you think ever, that if you take a moment and think before you respond, rather than reacting, everybody learns from everybody else around them everybody sees. You never know who is standing next to you, who is listening, who agrees with you, that will be helping you out and pulling you for the next job that you never knew was standing there. And you'll be surprised how many times where it came from that was like, oh, they were there. They know them. So always think about that and keep that in mind. It'll keep you from when you want to scream, might not do it just that way. You might do it privately. You know? <laughs> but it will help you so much because sometimes your jobs don't come from where you think it does. Sometimes it's from the person you never thought it would because they actually knew that person. Somebody that is not in your department, may not, just works in the production in the smallest way, but they know the other one and they're watching how well you do your job and they comment to other people. And the next shows that come, you'll be surprised how your name can get passed around so that they are looking at you for the job. So keep that in mind and make sure you love what you do because the hours are long. <laughs> <laughs> love what you do. <laughs> well, I just want to thoroughly thank all of you um, for, for being here, for being open, for sharing your experience. Um, with us because um, I think that um, you've brought up a lot of really 
um, important points and things that we can take away and um, it's really, really invaluable. So I'd like a round of applause for her. And I'd also just like to say that, I mean, I'd like to thank um, the School of the Arts. I'd like to thank Dean Kelly and, and Molly, because to have this kind of a forum um, is not something that um, a lot of people have access to. And um, so I'd, I'd just like to thank the school for opening up this space to have this conversation. But not least, I have to make a couple of announcements. Um, so I am supposed to remind you that the discussion groups will start at 7:30, and uh, please check and see what you're signed up for. As uh, all, a lot of the groups are almost full, um, and to remind you about art and making at 11 a.m. tomorrow and reception at 2 p.m. tomorrow in the DNP building. And with that, we are a wrap. <laughs> Thank you.